again, this, we hear about the, the bison slaughter in the late 19th century and bison being pushed to the edge of extinction. But we don't hear about the, the uh, equivalent slaughter of bald eagles and also within the lower 48s pushed to the brink of extinction. Um, and in 1917, the year that America joined in the fighting in, World War, in Europe during the Great War, uh, and the bald eagle followed Americans across the Atlantic um, as a symbol of the United States. The territory of Alaska uh, adopted a, passed a bald eagle bounty to uh, uh, ostensibly protect the salmon industry from an un unnecessary predator. Um, and that bald eagle bound, bounty, so a, a hunter could turn in a set of talons and collect 50 cents from the territory of Alaska. And that, and, and, and as a matter of fact, some uh, people went, became full-time bald eagle bounty hunters. Uh, and that bounty remained in effect until 1952. And during that period, uh, the territory of Alaska paid bounties on over 128,000 bald eagles. Um, so by the early 20th century, many, there were a number of Americans who were worried, who, were, who took note of what was happening and were worried about uh, the bald eagle going, going the way of the passenger pigeon, the last of which died in 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo, uh, or the Carolina parakeet, the last of which died in 1918, also in the Cincinnati Zoo. zoo. So um, the caveat here is never, don't go live in the Cincinnati Zoo. Uh, but other birds, had, you know, the auk, the great auk had, had gone extinct and and, um, and so Americans um, didn't want us, many Americans didn't want to see this happen to the bald eagle. Um, the, the, the bird that was the, uh, the species behind um, their uh, a national symbol. One of those people was Rosalie Edge here, who was the founder of Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, the founder of Hawk Mountain, Pennsylvania, uh, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in the 1930s. Um, she, um, pushed for protection of the bald eagle. And she encouraged National Audubon Society to do the same. Uh, and National Audubon wouldn't do it. Uh, it wouldn't take a stand against the Alaska bounty. It wouldn't take a stand it, uh, to protect a bald eagle in the, uh, uh, in, in the United States. And so Rosalie Edge founded her own organization called the, the Emergency Conservation Committee uh, to expose the duplicity within National Audubon um, and to try to get protection for the bald eagle. And she and many others eventually succeeded in 1940. Uh, Congress passed the Bald Eagle Protection Act, recognizing, and this is written in the, the law itself, recognizing that if the United States had allowed the bald eagle uh, to, go, uh, to go extinct, um, would have been duplicitous. It would have it would have undermined the integrity of a national seal, of a seal of free, of a symbol of freedom. And here was the bird of freedom being denied its, its own freedom. Uh, and as a result, the bald eagle was the first individual species to receive uh, protection by federal law. Other species, uh, other, uh, other protective legislation covered multiple species, um, but the bald eagle got its own law. That again was 1940. Well, what happens five years later in August 1945? Um, the, oops, I'm sorry, I have put up the wrong, <laughs> the wrong PowerPoint presentation. My apologies here. It must be the cocktail of painkillers uh, the doctors have me on. But uh, in it, DDT was released to the general mar market in uh, August 1945. And as the great seal or the image of the bald eagle became a hit in 1782 with the great seal of the United States, DDT became a great hit. The Americans beat the Germans, they beat the Japanese, now they wanted to beat the bugs. And uh, so this uh, uh, DDT was uh, pr probably the most popular chemical pesticide in the 1940s and 1950s, uh, used not just in farming uh, and in forestry, but also in people's homes. You could go down to the grocery store and there were a number of DDT products um, that were av available. And we blanketed the lower 48 states uh, with DDT. Um, and as a result, as you very well know, 
Um, the, the bird population in the United States uh, was devastated by uh, the excessive use of, of DDT, um, including the bald eagle. Of course, DDT uh, was sprayed on water to control um, uh, mosquitoes. It was sprayed everywhere. Uh, the toxic drift uh, went uh, to places that weren't necessarily targeted, but were affected by DDT. Uh, fish died or they uh, consumed DDT. Uh, uh, eagles ate the fish that, that uh, were, um, uh, um, uh, of course, contaminated with DDT. Uh, and they, they laid addled eggs or, or uh, eggs with poor uh, or, or thin shells. Uh, and in the 1940s, um, late 40s, um, the bald eagle population started to plummet. And this man in this tree, Charles Broly, uh, who moved to Tampa, Florida in 1935 after he retired as a, 1936, excuse me, uh, retired as a banker in Winnipeg started uh, to, to climb trees in retirement, um, uh, uh, 40, 50, 60, 70, even 80 foot tall loblolly and longleaf pines to ban eaglets. And nobody was doing it systematically when this non-scientist began doing it. Uh, and, he began, and he climbed trees for 20 years until age 79. And during that period, banded over 1,200 eaglets which was uh, a, a, a really important contribution to science because um, scientists weren't sure where bald eagles migrated and his banded birds, of course, um, revealed that story to, uh, to great extent. But because he was banning eagles from one year to the next and keeping an inventory of them in Florida, um, he saw their population declining dramatically. In 1958, published an article in Nature magazine making a connection between DDT and the decline of the bald eagle population. Uh, Rachel Carson, uh, of course, in her, uh, her famous book, Silent Spring, published in 1962, talks about Charles Broly and his work. Uh, and in that next year after Silent Spring was published, 1963, um, the bald eagle uh, was the year that uh, the first nationwide, or, uh, or at least of the lower 48, uh, nest count of, of bald eagles. And the number of nests were, uh, to exist in the lower 48 uh, were um, fewer than 500 in 1963. The bald eagle was not nesting in any of the New England states outside of Maine. It was not nesting in Ohio, which was a major bald eagle state at one time, was not nesting in New York, was not nesting in Pennsylvania was not nesting in the southern states outside of Florida. Um, it was in really bad shape. Um, and, uh, and fortunately, Americans um, uh, uh, took note uh, of what DDT was doing to not only bald eagles and ospreys and pelicans, brown pelicans disappeared from the northern Gulf Coast. Um, and uh, brown pelican, ironically, was the, still is, uh, the state bird of Louisiana, but in the 1960s, you couldn't find a brown pelican in Louisiana, um, mainly because of DDT. The other thing that was happening, of course, was habitat destruction. Um, of course, those watery habitats where bald eagles take their food is one form of destruction, but a lot of their nesting territory, in particularly in states like Florida, where um, um, their habitat was being, being destroyed. Uh, and so, uh, uh, people took note, um, attitudes about the human relationship with the environment began to change in the 1960s. All this came to head in 1970 with the first Earth Day uh, celebration. 20 million Americans participated in uh, the uh, events of uh, April 1970, um, the, the largest uh, demonstration or campaign is also a celebration. Um, in, in American history. Uh, and um, Congress took note, 1972 was a watershed year uh, in, in many ways. First of all, it was the uh, first year of, of the um, uh, uh, DuPage County bird count. So congratulations on your 50th anniversary. But um, uh, also during that year, um, the EPA banned uh, the sale of DDT in the United States, a very brave move on the part of 
of uh, William Ruckel's house, uh, the first administrator of the EPA appointed by uh, President Richard Nixon. And also Congress increased the penalty for harming a bald eagle under the bald eagle. It was known then the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Uh, and uh, also that year, uh, Congress passed the Clean Water Act, which in October will be 50 years old. Um, and an act that did went a long way to restoring the ecological health of bays and bayous and coastal waters around the country, those very watery habitats that the bald eagle depended upon. And in 1973, Congress passed the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the bald eagle uh, had been uh, an endangered, a federally endangered species dating back to the 1960s. Um, and it was one of the first to be included under the endangered species uh, list um, that, that was uh, 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 created by the Endangered uh, Species Act. Uh, and so with all of these chess pieces in place, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife launched a eagle restoration um, program in the bicentennial, bicentennial year, 1976. Um, restoration programs were organized or, or initiated across the country by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but also by uh, state wildlife managers. Uh, and these, these restoration programs were hugely successful. Uh, and the way they worked is, for instance, as I mentioned, uh, no state in New England outside of, out of Maine had any nesting bald eagles. So a restoration project was launched in 1982 in Massachusetts. And eaglets were removed from healthy areas such as parts of um, northern Illinois, um, Wisconsin and Minnesota, Canada and Alaska, and relocated five or six weeks to uh, pack boxes, what I call these big giant lions cages, uh, lion cages that were uh, 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 put up on stilts outdoors uh, and the eaglets were raised in makeshift nests, nests within these hack boxes exposed to the elements as they would be um, uh, in their own nest. Uh, and they uh, were fed from behind blinds and then released at 12 weeks of age uh, or approximately 12 uh, weeks of age. And during that period, they're living in those hack boxes, they would imprint on that territory and their minds and in their minds, that territory uh, such as Massachusetts for say these Wisconsin birds became there in their minds, their natal territory and bald eagles return at uh, breeding age to typically return to their natal territory uh, to mate and to build nests. Um, and so this was done across the country. And again, it was a huge success uh, on the part of the, uh, uh, the, the national, excuse me, the uh, fish, uh, fish and wildlife, but uh, also local agencies, many volunteers, also, what was going on during this period in the 70s and 80s and 90s, you see this emergence of uh, raptor restoration centers across the country, uh, some of them focusing principally upon eagles, um, raptor restoration centers, but also education centers. This woman uh, in, uh, pictured here is Doris Magger, who was with Florida Audubon uh, and then eventually moved to North Carolina and then to Washington State. She devoted her life uh, to protecting raft, uh, raptors uh, traveling around the country, uh, giving lectures in schools uh, and uh, Kmart uh, shopping center parking lots. Uh, here she is uh, finishing up a, a bike ride across the United States from San Diego uh, to Florida. Uh, stop and Kmart was her sponsor, stopping in there in parking lots and giving lectures uh, to raise awareness about bald eagles, but also to raise money for uh, raptor centers. Uh, so there's this new awareness um, uh, along with the, the, that parallels the restoration of the bald eagle. Uh, by 1999, the bald eagle population, the nesting population in the lower 48 was healthy enough uh, for the bald eagle to come off the endangered species list, um, bureaucratic uh, inertia in Washington, um, um, which is, uh, as we know, is quite common, uh, delayed delisting until 2007 when the lower 48 nesting population was between 10 and 11,000. Uh, and 
that restoration, that comeback, that, fan, that, that remarkable comeback of the bald eagles, I should point out in the 2010s, the bald eagle population um, uh, quadrupled. Uh, in the lower 48 today, the overall population, not just the population, uh, nesting population is uh, well over 300,000. And continent-wide, um, uh, the, the bald eagle population is, is around 500,000, equivalent to the estimated size of the population at the time of European contact. Now, that remarkable comeback story uh, is attributable not only to the changing attitudes of Americans, and the efforts of volunteers and wildlife officials, but the bald eagles themselves. Um, bald eagles have what I call the, the ideal family values. They mate for life. Uh, they maintain a fidelity to the same nest for life as long as that nest uh, continues to exist. Um, they um, rebuild or they add on to the nest every year. They refurbish it. Um, it, gets, it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, one nest I write about in the book uh, in, in Ohio in the 1920s um, reached uh, well over 10 feet across the top, 12 feet deep. Uh, the, um, the, the old hickory that it was in it had been in for 35 years, finally said, what the hell? I can't hold this nest anymore. It collapsed. Um, and the scientists studying that nest estimated its weight to be two tons. Um, and... Uh, so you can see in this picture, you see Spanish moss. These are some Florida eagles, local eagles to me. Um, and uh, they bring uh, Spanish moss back to their nest every day uh, to uh, repad uh, the bowl or the, the actual nesting area of the nest for the young. And they care for their, for their eggs and then their, um, their chicks. And they care, and of course, here's an image of a, an immature, it's probably a couple of years old, um, generally, when they, they leave their natal territory uh, after they fledge, some weeks, a few weeks after they fledge, they're, they're pretty much all chocolate brown. So this one's probably a year or two uh, old. Um, they, they, uh, they care for their, their young with such devotion. They feed them so well that when the young leave their natal territory after they fledge, they typically weigh more than their parents. And they are fed so well that now a Florida eagle, a Mississippi eagle might migrate, uh, an immature, uh, might, might migrate to, um, to Illinois, even Canada. Uh, but it, during breeding season, even though it's not a breeding age, that, that young eagle will return to Mississippi because it remembers how well mom and dad fed it. It'll even go back to that same nest and look for food. Uh, as if it's the refrigerator that mom and dad are stocking for. Um, but mom and dad have a new generation they're focusing on. And so they have to keep the older generation uh, at, at bay. Uh, here's a, a map of their migration pattern. Um, they, don't, they don't fly all the way out over the Atlantic. I, I drew these lines uh, intentionally like this so you could actually see them. There wouldn't just be this one black slab uh, running up the East Coast. But the Florida eagles, some of them go as far as Canada. Some of them will only go next door to Georgia. Uh, some of them stay nearby. Uh, they'll branch between nesting season nearby where their, their nest is. Um, um, and here are, the, again, um, the Mississippi eagles flying north, Louisiana eagles. Uh, typically, northern bald eagles fly south um, and uh, southern bald eagles fly north. Uh, well, here's one thing that I found very interesting. Colorado eagles migrating to Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan eagles migrating to Colorado. I don't know if they wave a wing at each other as they pass, um, and, um, but it's, it's not um, impossible that Colorado eagles are feeding or fishing at the same fishing holes as the Saskatchewan eagles did uh, before they left and, and vice versa. And uh, so that's the end of my, my PowerPoint. Um, again, this is a, a remarkable, um, I gotta stop sharing here, remarkable conservation success story. Uh, when we see a bald eagle across in the sky, I like to say um, that's a pat on our back for doing right by the environment. Why don't I stop there and uh, take any questions you might have?
Thank you, Jack. Really enjoyed the uh, journey you took us on for the about the bald eagle here. I, I'll start off with a question or two, and then we'll see if any of the other members of the viewership here type in something into the chat area. But uh, uh, one, I, I've heard that some people still resent the ban on DDT. Did you come across that any? You know, well, people in the industry, a lot of people in the industry do, and the industry is still writing op-eds. Um, and, you know, DDT uh, has some successes. Um, it, it was hugely, I mean, the reason why it was released to the general public is because it was used during World War II uh, to control lice, and, uh, which was associated with um, um, uh, typhus. And uh, many maintain that uh, World War II was the first war in which fewer Americans um, died uh, by disease than um, by enemy fire, um, which is perhaps true. And it did uh, help control insects uh, in forestry, in agriculture. Um, the issue was that it was used excessively. Um, the industry controlled the narrative as it as industry, as the cigarette industry, their own quote unquote experts and scientists control the narrative around the health of cigarette smoking. Lead industry was the same. Uh, and uh, mercury industry, absolutely, again, the same industry personnel controlling the narrative. Um, and that was true with chemical pesticides. Uh, and of course, one of the arguments that chemists, chemists were making was that, or at least industry chemists were making, is that. Uh, there was no residual effects in food from DDT, that DDT would not he hurt humans. Well, recent um, uh, studies have shown, have linked um, exposure of DDT uh, uh, to breast cancer of not necessarily the individual who was directly exposed, but her daughter and her granddaughters. Uh, and also um, studies of linked DDT to Alzheimer's as, as well. Um, and so, yes, there are, and there are people still saying that DDT was a good thing and we overreacted. Um, and uh, I, 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 would, I would disagree. Yeah. Hey, um, Bob Fisher raises a, a question uh, regarding uh, an, another current threat to bald eagles. And that would be wind turbines. And uh, so uh, the greatest threat to, uh, uh, let me speak to that. My greatest threat to bald eagles right now is lead poisoning and um, um, lead poisoning from hunting. Now, hunters are among our first and, and most devoted conservationists. Uh, big hunters, big game hunters, which in this country means you know, elk and deer, uh, typically use uh, lead shot in bullets. Uh, and they and they typically gut their kill out in the woods. Seems like a great idea. Keep the mess out there, but also repurpose it, right? Leave it for the scavengers. Well, unfortunately, the bald eagle is a scavenger. And, um, and, and, a, and of course, there's lead in those gut piles. And a shard of lead the size of a, of a grain of rice can kill a bald eagle. So right now, that's their greatest threat. Uh, power line strikes uh, are a threat. Uh, car strikes are a threat as the population continues to uh, 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 thrive. And as our own population continues to grow, there are going to be more increasing number of collisions between us and, and bald eagles. And yes, um, uh, wind turbines um, are, can be, it depends on who owns those turbines, uh, can be a, a significant threat. Uh, of course, there was a recent news uh, just this past week of a wind energy company uh, that was fine uh, significantly for killing. I've forgotten how many, some, you know, like 150. Uh, yeah. hundred at least at the minimum, 150 bald eagles. Well, this wind company um, didn't have, did not install the technology that is available to it. Uh, Duke energy has a wind site. They don't like to, the industry I've learned in writing the book. I don't like the term wind farm. Um, but they have a wind site in Wyoming uh, in which they've installed artificial intelligence technology um, that uh, can detect, and of course, artificial intelligence technology just, just gets smarter, uh, can detect when birds are in, in the area. And the person who's behind this, um, uh, the industry 
um, uh, wildlife official, I mean, the uh, Duke Energy's wildlife person who uh, is really spearheaded the installation of this technology has a long history in bald eagles dating back to the 1980s when he worked in bald eagle restoration in, uh, in Indiana. Uh, and the artificial intelligence technology that they've installed on their wind turbines has reduced eagle deaths um, um, by uh, well over 80%. So the technology's there. Uh, many um, energy companies are using it. Um, and it's, um, uh, it, I think it's just a matter of, um, of their priorities, but also perhaps uh, policy um, coming from the Department of the Interior or somewhere in the federal government requiring when to, uh, uh, this technology to prevent not only bald eagle deaths, but golden eagle and, and of course, uh, uh, migrating um, uh, birds. Yeah. In your book, I really enjoyed reading about some of the characters that uh, were helping the eagle along the way. Uh, people that we don't know about, like Francis Herrick and Charles Broly, Doris Mager, Diane LaFrance. Um, can you share a little bit more about one of your favorites there? Uh, Doris Mager, uh, probably, if I have to name a favorite, uh, Doris Mager, um, I interviewed her in the middle of COVID. Uh, we talked on the phone. She was uh, 94 at the time. In the year before, just before COVID, she had driven from Washington to Connecticut and by herself in a van with an owl that she'd had for 30 years named E.T. for extra terrific that she was donating to a, um, a, a raptor center in, in Connecticut. Uh, Doris Magger was still up, to, to COVID, up until COVID, still out giving talks at schools and elsewhere. She said after um, COVID, she was going to get back out on the road and continue to, continue to do her work. But she was just, you know, she, this was a woman, as you, as you recall, Mike, who spent six days in, a, in an eagle's nest, living in an eagle's nest in 1979 in Florida and abandoned them to, to raise away awareness. Yeah. Um, and she was just a wonderful uh, person to interview and, and to write about. Now, you might see that bald eagle head in the frame behind me. Diane LaFrancois, who worked um, with the Ma in Massachusetts with the Eagle Restoration there, painted that. She's now retired and she's, she's taken up painting. And mm. I just, I was, she sent that to me and I was blown away by it. Oh, nice. Uh, but another, another fantastic, uh, just, uh, there are a lot of heroes um, in, in this book. Uh, and you've named a number of them. Um, uh, but among those heroes are also the bald eagles themselves. Uh, thank you. Uh, just another question or two, if you have time. Sure. Um, we had a question about uh, eagles migrating north and south, and some people didn't yeah. understand how why that happened. Science doesn't understand either. <laughs> uh, we um, we don't. You know, for many years, scientists maintained that the bald eagle was not a migrating bird. Um, uh, ornithologists were testifying before Congress when Congress was heard the first, was considering the first Bald Eagle Protection Act in 1930. Um, and they said, no, the bald eagle is not a migrating bird. Uh, T. Gilbert Pearson, the president of Audubon, said the same thing. Um, and that um, gave, uh, in, in fact, one scientist, one ornithologist testifying, maintained, or reminded Congress that for it to protect the bald eagle would be interfering in state affairs because the bald eagle is not a migrator. Uh, and uh, so that torpedoed the legislation. We're really just learning, science is really just learning a lot about, uh, more and more about bald eagles because um, it was, again, it was missing for so many decades and there weren't enough specimens around to, um, uh, to study. And, uh, but also science was focused on restoration. And now that the bald eagle population is healthy again, they're starting to study uh, it again. It's, it, it, there, there's no, you know, consistent pattern in the migration of an individual bald eagle. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not like other mig many migrating birds, um, such as shorebirds and songbirds, in which their migration patterns are very predictable. Um, but um, bald eagles have, we'll just put it, leave it this way. Bald eagles have their own mind. 
Okay. Um, but do the juveniles tend to go back to where they were hatched to? Uh, yes, yes, to that was, that okay. was, yes. That's what made restoration, uh, the hacking program successful. And I should say the, 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 the juveniles tend to be the longer distance migrators. Um, and they, um, what we do know about migration is that bald eagles typically migrate uh, to, uh, to find food. For instance, Southern bald eagles, when they go north, they may be going north because as the water, say the, the lake or the river that they live beside, uh, is as it's warming up, the fish drop down to the bottom where the water's cooler. So the fishing isn't as good. So they'll leave to go north where waters are cooler um, and uh, find fish near the surface. Or they'll go to a place like Conowingo Dam uh, in Northern Maryland where the, the pickings are easy because as the fish run through the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, water tunnels through the dam, um, they're, they're left on the downside of the dam, uh, either dead or stunned. And so uh, they're easy pickings. But yes, they, they return to their natal territory um, to uh, at, at breeding age. It's rare for them not to go back to their natal territory. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why, you know, the, you know, for instance, Massachusetts, um, that eagle hacking program repopulated the, the New England states. Uh, you know, bald eagles are territorial, so if they can't go back to Quabbin Reservoir, where the hacking program is located, they'll go somewhere nearby. Uh, Thank you. To, yeah. We had several questions about uh, the lead shot. Is there something that we can do to reduce the amount of lead shot? Yes, absolutely. So that has already been done in waterfowl hunting years ago. Lead shot was um, uh, at the initiative of, of game uh, fowl hunters or game hunters, uh, sport hunters, was, was uh, um, a ban in waterfowl hunting because the lead not only poisoned the kill, but the, uh, the environment, the, the aquatic environment. And because lead shot would sink to the bottom of a lake or a pond uh, and spoil that place. And, uh, and so they, uh, they, they now use steel bullets in waterfowl hunting, but that doesn't work with big game. Uh, steel will run right through a, a deer in many cases. Um, they need something to uh, implode like lead. And what does that is uh, um, best probably is copper. The issue is copper is slightly more expensive. And today, because of various resource sh shortages, it's harder to get. Um, and the federal government did um, uh, the, the Obama administration did um, uh, and banned lead shot in national wildlife refuges. Um, but then the next administration, uh, Ron Zink's, um, one of his first actions was to restore lead, saying it's not fair to the hunters. Um, but I don't think a lot of hunters realize what, what's happening. Mm. Uh, and, and again, I, they, they care about, they tend to care about the environment. And I think they would make a shift. There are also other materials that um, can substitute. The problem is they're, they're a bit more expensive. I see. Well, Jack, you've been very uh, informative and uh, I really enjoyed reading your book and I hope more of our members have an opportunity to read it as well. So thank you for being with us here this evening and, and best of luck on this book and future books from you. Well, thank you. And thanks for having me, Mike. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, now for uh, those of you that would like to stay on for a little bit, I have a couple of uh, short PowerPoints. The one on where can we find bald eagles around us here in uh, Illinois? And if I can find them, I will share those with you. And if I can figure out how to share my screen, that will be next. So we have, um, we do have a number of, of bald eagles here in, in Illinois. Um, 
I came across a report from the uh, newspaper saying that it was back in 2004 on the banks of the Little Calumet River in Chicago that a nest of bald eagles was spotted. And that was the first bald eagle nest found in more than 100 years in the Chicago land area. So I thought that was very interesting that uh, even as recently as 2004, there were not very many around Chicago land. Um, today, many different bald eagle nests have been spotted in the six counties around uh, Chicago. Um, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service estimated that there are about 3,100 bald eagles who winter in Illinois over 27 different counties, uh, making it second only to Alaska with a number of migratory eagles. So if I can, so one of the places that's very close to us is Green Valley. And the Green Valley on the east side by the area that we call the flood, you can see in the blow up on the right side, the flood is where we see a, a number of wonderful shorebirds in the springtime and, and birds that kind of like to be in that low muddy area. But just a little north of there, there is a bald eagle nest and difficult to see once the summertime hits because of all the trees and the foliage. But um, there are signs that are put up to prevent people or dissuade people from walking towards it. Uh, but uh, you, we can regularly see bald eagles in the Green Valley area. Um, there's a bridge not far from there, and I caught this bald eagle juvenile uh, just hovering, not hovering, but uh, perched in, in a tree right above that bridge by the, uh, by the flutle. And a uh, place that uh, we often go birding is the um, oops, Centennial Trail down in Lamont. And as you walk along that trail along the Des Plaines River, um, we can see bald eagles flying over quite often. And you can see that circle there. That circle is the area where there is a bald eagle nest. Uh, very difficult to see. Um, simply because it's on a very busy, you have to stop on a busy road to uh, where the concrete trucks are going back and forth. Um, but uh, there is a bald eagle nest back in there, but you can see them flying and perched all along the, the Des Plaines River. Here's a picture of a bald eagle coming in for a landing uh, in the winter time there on the uh, Centennial Trail area. Uh, another place that uh, it's kind of an unusual spot for bald eagles is the uh, moose heart. And you can see the circled area here, and that is a parking lot adjacent to the stadium at Moose Heart. And here is the tree holding the bald eagle nest at the top, and that's been there for, for many years. So that's kind of an unusual place, fairly close to us, to see a bald eagle nest uh, quite clearly. And, uh, and the eagles coming and, and going there. Um, about an hour and a half away, we have Starved Rock. And uh, that's a popular state park. If you go down by the, uh, the river edge there uh, and along the dam, you can see uh, bald eagles from both the north and the south side of uh, the, uh, the river there. Uh, we went down there one March and saw bald eagles flying over the river and by the dam there. And uh, if you want to go even a little farther afield, now this is two hours away uh, on the Mississippi River, but uh, we have gone to Lock and Dam number 13 there in Fulton. Um, and the bald eagles like to congregate there catching fish as they come through the dam. They get stunned as they come through the dam. And, and we saw uh, 26 eagles just perched in the trees uh, surrounding the dam area. So I would uh, encourage of you, all of you, to get out there and, and look for the bald eagles that are in our area here. And 
let me just finish up. Uh, Mike? Yes, go could, right ahead. If I could add to the local population. Yes, thank you. There's an active nest at Fermilab, which it's in an, in an accessible site or part of the site, but certainly those birds that are nesting there are, are probably the ones that uh, people are seeing over Blackwell. Uh, we just had one at McKee Marsh uh, when we were doing our beginner's bird class uh, last Saturday. Uh, so oh, so there's, a, there's an active nest there. I think this is the third year for that nest. And there is also a nest uh, very close to the Forest Preserve District uh, headquarters, just to the south southwest of the headquarters. There's another nest there near the heron rookery that's out there. Oh yeah, yeah, thanks Dennis. That I, I have seen uh, bald eagles there and uh, in Furby. So uh, thanks for the reminder about that. How about anybody else have any tips on where to see bald eagles in our area? You have to unmute yourself, but. Along Illinois River, from roughly Lakin down to Peoria. It's about a two hour and two and a half hour drive. There are a number of active nests. The bald eagles moved back into the Illinois River Valley in the last five years. Last winter, uh, I had property along the Illinois River and um, out on the ice, I saw six bald eagles, two adults and four juveniles sharing a, uh, a lunch of this Asian jumping carp. So uh, hmm. we're taking care of our carp uh, in, in, invaders and uh, enjoying it all themselves. But so along the Illinois River, if you're heading down to the Peoria area, they're down in there. Good, anybody else? Well, like I said earlier, before everybody was on, uh, we saw a bald eagle being attacked by the osprey this morning. And uh, it was at Blackwell. And it's possible that it's the one of the bald eagles from around the old Bell Labs uh, property, because that's near where the headquarters is. So mm -hmm. it's from that nest. And also, we do all the monitoring. We're in charge of the monitors for the arboretum. So in the arboretum, we see bald eagles land on the property on occasion, but constantly they're flying over the river looking for fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we have seen them occasionally. I, I count uh, the bald eagles a backyard bird because I was standing in the backyard and saw one flying down the DuPage River over in the Arboretum. Yep, they're, they're uh, hoping at the Arboretum that they'll nest there, but that's uh, debatable and doubtful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, anybody else uh, seen uh, a good place for, for spotting bald eagles? I'm just going to check the chat here. Uh, oh. Someone just asked Jerry, why wouldn't they nest at the ARB? Uh, it's because the bald eagles are still a bit sensitive to people. And there's also, uh, it looks like there's not the proper trees that they're seeing. We've seen them uh, in pairs. We've seen them flying and, you know, looking. But it's the same thing with the cranes. Cranes have landed on the property in the last couple of years. And uh, cranes are looking for nesting sites. And uh, just last week, one came, uh, was going uh, north down the Page River towards Hidden Lake. And at Hidden Lake, they've been seen there uh, in nesting activity. But there, you have to be in a boat to see them. And you have to go through the forest preserve to get there. All right, thanks, Jerry. Um, someone uh, mentioned that uh, Bussy Woods, you can see a bald eagle nest that's been there for quite a while, uh, but you see it best from the Northwest Tollway. So don't know how practical that is. Um, Rock Run Rookery in Will County is another place that someone mentioned. Uh, we, we've seen two, three eagles there at a time. And- uh, uh, Palos in the Palos Forest Preserves uh bald eagles have about five nests in that forest preserve it's large but uh lake tamper uh a couple of large lakes there uh they go fishing mm -hmm. okay 
All right, a couple of people asked about uh, whether or not the book, uh, The Bald Eagle by Jack Davis is available in the Morton Arboretum Library. I don't know. So you might wanna call if you're interested or I'm sure there's other places that would be happy to provide that to you. Um, so I really enjoyed Jack's uh, presentation. Uh, I hope all of you did too. Saw many comments about it, so um, thanks. If you want to check the chat, uh, you can see more places that people are putting on where to see bald eagles. And then I'm going to uh, wrap things up by just kind of giving everybody an overview of the winners of our first annual photo photographic contest. And um, we can, let's see, go to the beginning. And so for the first time, uh, DBC sponsored a photography contest and we uh, didn't know what to expect, but we were very pleasantly surprised to see over 44 entries uh, of pictures for the contest. Uh, you can go to our website and, and uh, see them, uh, but uh, we did have a team of DBC members that looked at those 44 pictures and, uh, and named some as, uh, as award winners. And so uh, let's take a look at our best photograph uh, by Dennis Stricker, uh, Barry Pretty, uh, the cedar waxwing there, uh, beautiful picture. And Hanging at the Birch Cafe by Jackie Tills the common red pole. The best picture taken out of the United States, Kathy Walls. Are you giving me the side eye? And here's a beautiful picture by Rich Roche about the red-bellied woodpecker among the red berries. And we had to have a bald eagle winner. This is a once in a lifetime shot as two bald eagles are fighting over the fish caught by one of them. And one of course is saying, this one is all mine, go get your own by Jeannie Rasson. Sorry if I'm butchering everybody's names. Um, Michael Davern, uh, the best interaction. There's two Rufus hummingbirds uh, meeting midair here. Great shot, uh, action shot. And uh, Andrew Steinman uh, had a humorous caption, line up double file, as he said that he has seen these uh, black neck stilts lined up as pairs in, in several different countries. And here's our best rarity picture the Lewistic common red pole that was at Cindy Duracell's um, feeder all winter long. That's a beautiful sharp looking bird there. And Joe Sujeki, uh, best artistic quality. There's black on white with a little blue. See that great blue heron sticking his neck up on the right side of all those American white pelicans. Beautiful shot, Joe. And our best bird in flight, a moment in time or a thousand, a one sixteen hundredth of a second. Laurel Alanus, a golden eye. And our best holiday picture, because it was our winter photographic contest. I just want to be a part of the festivities. Cindy Durancell in her backyard with neighbors' ornaments around. And the best photograph by young birder, our Henry Mead keeping a watch from above as the great blue heron looked down across the river. And then we had two special shots uh, that had wonderful stories attached with them and would encourage you to read those stories in the drummings. Uh, Bonnie Graham submitted this one 
uh, the European uh, goldfinch and, uh, and uh, quite a story about how she got this shot. And then Hazim uh, was up in Saxon Bog and uh, got this picture of a great gray owl and you'll wanna read his description of how he got that shot as well. So we do have a new one coming up. We just opened up for the spring photography contest. It will be going on until May 31st. So we encourage you to get out there with your pictures. These, uh, as you can see, we are not looking for the best beautiful uh, photographic quality pictures. We are looking for interesting pictures, great stories associated with them, humorous captions that, that capture our imagination. So encourage you to, again, look on drummings, find the link into the website and upload your pictures there. And I think that's it for the for that. Uh, Natalie, Steve, anybody else? Anything else for the good of the the group here? No, I think you covered it all great. <laughs> yeah, good. it was a very interesting night. I thought our speaker was terrific. So thank you very much. Good. I don't know if Steve had anything, but I don't have anything. Yeah. Else well, I would encourage you all to check the chat. Uh, on, <clears throat> there's people are still putting information in there about eagles and articles and so on uh, before you log off. But uh, we'll say good night to all of you and thanks for being a part of this. We had uh, upwards of 100 people on Zoom tonight. So uh, thanks for taking some time out to be with us and have a good night. And then we 